All right, guys, we're going to get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to join me here and specifically join me at the bottom of the screen. And so, guys, this is not only where we left off in terms of the material, but it's also where we sort of, where, 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 where we, we not wrestled, but maybe, um, you know, Kaylee asked the question about what's up with oxide as a strong base. And, uh, and so guys, th this is where we need to be so that we can move forward together. Um, so we, we got, we, we started, I know it's been a while cause we did the test rewrites last time. It was Monday. Because we talked about Arrhenius, we talked about Bronsted Lowry, we talked about the interesting similarities and differences between the two. Then as we got into the Bronsted Lowry definition of acids and bases, we talked about acids being proton donors and bases being proton acceptors. And then guys, we caught up with this idea of conjugates. And we said that when an acid loses a proton, it's now proton deficient. And it may want to take a proton back. And when it, function, when it does, it functions as a base. And then we said bases are proton acceptors. And when bases do that, they gather up a proton. But when they do, they now have an extra proton that they may give away as an acid. But then we said this, and we talked about the idea. Oops, hold on. Sorry, I need my writing utensils. Guys, we talked about this idea of what makes acids and bases strong and weak. And we said this. We said that if we've got an acid that gives away hydrogens completely, the thing that causes it to give away hydrogens completely is because its conjugate base is incapable of, of, of taking hydrogens in. Those are our strong acids. And then if we've got strong bases, those are things that, that take in hydrogens completely and their strong acids are incapable of giving them away. Are we all caught up there? Okay. So then, guys, that led us to this. Yeah, I don't know why this is doing this. It's... Um, just a moment. I think this is... Well, I don't know if this is going to fix it, but I think it's worth trying. Um, get rid. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. Come over here. Um, grab. Where do I go? Um, not that. Shoot. Where'd it go? Maybe that's the problem. This. Oh wait. Let's try this. I may have just found the problem. All right, here we go. So we are going to align my product. All right, so we're going to go bump, 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 bump. Oh, shoot, this is hard because I can't touch my board. Uh, bump, bump. This is like the world's worst video game. Actually, that titration lab might be the world's worst video game. <laughs> All right, let's see if that helps. All right, so guys, I mentioned to this to you before. You're going to have to sort of limp along with me. If it's not this, then it's my hub. And if that's the case, I'm just going to have to replace it. But let's see what happens. Okay, so guys, we're, we're then in touch with this idea 
This should not come as a surprise to you, but we need to now, if you haven't yet, guys, now's the time and the place to start is the summer homework. No, summer quiz. Guys, now's the time to start bringing some of those things back in front of us. And so guys, we talked about the strong acids. We know that they're the ones that completely protonate and we know that there are seven of them. They are HCl, HBr, HI, HClO3, HClO4, HNO3, and H2SO4. And the thing they all have in common is they completely give away hydrogens. Then guys, we've got what we're calling our weak acids. And those are things that do give away hydrogens, but they don't do it obviously completely. They do it partially. And uh, those are the ones that each reach equilibrium. But now guys, understand you know more about that now than you did before, because now you know why. So if you're writing this down, let me let you catch up. But guys, we're gonna stop and we're gonna talk about why. And if you don't understand why, this is something we need to include in, in your collective understanding. So we understand that strong acids give away hydrogens completely and weak acids don't. Y'all caught up if you're writing this down? Guys, could you please explain to the person next to you why weak acids only partly give away hydrogens? So guys, let me pull this together, and what I'm, I'm going to put Josh and Cole on the spot in just a second. Here's the thing that I loved. The minute you guys started talking about this, I didn't hear any of you say acid. In this conversation about why are weak acids weak acids, none of you said acid. The first chemical term that came out of your mouth was base. And that's exactly what should have happened. But then, guys, as I heard you talk about this more deeply, the word conjugate started to come out, right? And, guys, that's the important connection that we need to have is that when we think about substances that are weak acids, you can picture them giving away hydrogens and forming a conjugate base because those conjugate bases are sometimes really pretty good bases, and they take those hydrogens back in. And when they do, they push the equilibrium in the other direction. And they go both directions. And that's what makes them weak acids. But Josh, as I was hearing you and Cole talk, you, you came to the point where you had a question. And that's awesome. What was, I didn't, but I didn't hear the question. What was it? Yeah, you're good. You were looking at your paper and you were, it looked like you were tracking like a reaction maybe. Yeah. And how it goes to like the strongest base. Yes. Yeah. And so we were kind of, I was kind of like, we were kind of going along and I was like, oh, because the conjugate base is strong enough to go in the reverse. But then I was like, does that actually answer the question? And it does. That is, ab and not only does it answer the question, it's actually the underlying principle for this idea that the stronger an acid, the weaker its conjugate base. And that goes all the way to worthless, right? And it's a continuum. If you have a strong acid, you have a worthless conjugate base, but as the acid gets weaker, the conjugate base gets stronger. You guys good on that idea? Please, Isaac. Yes. Yes. 
That's a great question, and the answer is it's weaker relative to all bases. And so what we are going to find is, well, so let's do this. If you've got a strong acid, you've got a base. And guys, this is, this is, we're going we're gonna to quantify this in just a minute, because don't miss this. If you've got a strong acid, then you've got a, a base that's worthless. And then as the acid gets weaker, the base gets stronger. And so, but that's relative to other acids that are either weaker or stronger in their conjugates. So it's relative. And it's actually represented in this. So I think, Isaac, your question's answer may be best contained in this. Because let this soak in, if you will, for a minute. So on the left, we have the acids. And on the right, we have their conjugate bases. So guys, let's talk. So as we look at this, we begin to see this relationship between acid and conjugate strengths. And so tell me, can I zoom out from this and can it still be something we can talk about or do I need to zoom back in? Is it okay if I leave it there? Okay. So guys, the idea is this. So here we have three of the seven strong acids. We could have put all seven of them there, but we only put three. But guys, what do you know about their, their conjugate bases? They are of negligible strength, or they're worthless, or however we talk about that. And then, guys, as we move down, these acids get weaker and weaker and weaker. And as the acids get weaker and weaker and weaker, their conjugate bases get stronger and stronger and stronger. Until we get down here. And, um, oh, I thought O2 was on here, but it's not. But it should be. And that was to your question, Kim. But, guys, it is there? Oh, there, oh, shoot, there it is. And so there's the idea. So now when we look on the other, let's, let's keep looking at the acid side. So guys, well, actually, no, let's look at the base side. So now when we look at the base side of this, we've got things that are strong bases, and now their conjugate acids are worthless, meaning that these things are horrible at giving away acids, but their conjugates are really good at functioning as bases. Um, so guys, we've got a continuum. As these get weaker, their conjugates get stronger. But guys, here's the interesting point. When we say weaker or stronger, and Kaylee, we touched on this, but now we're going to talk about it. Weaker and stronger than what? And guys, the answer is water. When something is weaker or stronger, the cutoff is relative to water and the things that it forms when it functions as an acid and a base. So our frame of reference for strength is water. So when we say something is a strong acid, we mean that it's better at giving away hydrogen ions than hydronium ion. And when we say that something is a strong base, we mean that it's better at taking in hydrogen ions than hydroxide. Because this should make sense. Because we know that the strong bases are the hydroxide containers and we know that the strong acids are the things that form lots of hydronium. So guys, if that seems a little muddled or weird, just understand this. When we say weak and strong, what we're talking about is relative to water and the things that water forms. And then the idea is that as an acid gets weaker, the conjugates get stronger and vice versa. So guys, I know there's a lot of detail to this, but if you can simply keep track of the idea that the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate, you're really just fine right there. But I felt like we needed to come back and touch on what Kaylee was talking about last time. So things you want to explore there with the understanding that really the only thing you need to understand is the relationship between the strength of an acid and its conjugate. Yeah? Yeah. Sorry, I missed it as a question. Say it again. Yes. Isn't it the ones that go to completion? 
Yes. And then why are you comparing it to H3O? Okay, let, let's do this. So I, I understand, I think I understand your question now. So why is H3O, guys, don't miss this, Spencer, join me. Guys, why is it that H3O is our comparator? Well, watch this. Take a strong acid like HCl and take water. And when we mix these together, we get hydronium ion and we get chloride ion, right? So there's our there's our so here's our HCl, here's our hydronium ion. Which one is better at giving away hydrogens, HCl or hydronium? How do we know that it's HCl? Because it goes that way, right? If this was better at giving hydronium ion away, it would go this way. So by definition, a substance that is, is a strong acid is a substance that's better at giving away hydrogen than hydronium. And that's what this says. So these substances are better at giving away hydrogen than hydronium. Okay. Um, and so that's why we use hydronium as our comparator because all acids form this. The strong acids are stronger acids than hydronium ion. Is that weird? Because that's the underlying concept. Other thing. And Spencer, were you guys talking about something that we could all, like, sorry, I know that was a little, are you guys okay? Okay. So guys, are you good on the idea? Okay, so moving past this then, let's draw a line in the sand. We know what Arrhenius acids and bases are, yes? Bronze and Lowry, yes? Conjugate acids and bases, yes? And the relationship between um, acid or base strength and conjugate strength, also yes? All right. Then guys, here's where we're headed. Grab your AP equation sheets. I should have had you do this earlier, but I forgot. Grab your AP equation sheets, and we're going to do some funny chemistry. So guys, before we get into the funny chemistry, there's one thing that I need to make sure we're clear on. Do you understand what amphoteric means? What does that mean? Could be an acid or a base. Okay. So, and guys, you understand water's amphoteric, right? Okay. Do you also understand that water is not the only thing that's amphoteric? Let me show you an example. Guys, don't write this down, but just, I know that when we teach, why isn't that working? I really, I mean, it, if I click, oh, Okay. Well, maybe it's just slow. Um, so let's do, let's do this. Um, HSO4 minus. Don't write this down. Um, but let's do... So, guys, and actually, you should know the name of this. What's SO4? What do we call it if we add a hydrogen? Bi, right? Bisulfate. Guys, the bisulfate ion is actually another substance that's amphoteric. So if you, sorry, this should be more, I'm going to have to scrunch the, the stuff over here. But guys, bisulfate is also amphoteric. Um, if you put it with a base, a base will actually take a hydrogen from it and it forms sulfate and ammonium. So in this case, that gave away a hydrogen and it functioned as an acid. But it can also function as a base. And it can do, oh wait, that's no, that's no, oh, it didn't write, good. So, um, so guys, it can also function as, as a base and it can take in hydrogens and it forms, in this case, well, it goes back to sulfuric acid. Isn't that weird? That the, the product of the first protonation of a sulfuric acid is actually amphoteric. So this can function as a base or an acid, and it depends on the acidity or basicity of the thing that it's being mixed with. So there's another example of something that, but you understand amphoteric, right? Okay, that was the point. All right, so clicking slowly, I really, okay. I guess I just have to move slower. All right. So, guys, moving along then 
keeping in front of us this idea of water being amphoteric. Because I would encourage you to write down this term, auto-ionization. You guys are about to have an aha moment. So guys, it goes like this. Water is amphoteric. Water can function as an acid. Water can function as a base. And when you have a big old beaker full of water, we've got water molecules hanging out. And some of those water molecules just randomly can function as acids. And some of those uh, water molecules can just randomly function as bases. And when they do, they actually do this chemistry. This is water reacting with water. So this is the balanced equation for water reacting with itself. One of the molecules just by chance functions as an acid. One of the molecules just by chance functions as the base. And when that happens, obviously the, the water that took in the hydrogen forms hydronium ion, and the other one forms hydroxide ion. Now guys, your challenge becomes this. Write the KC expression for this, this process. Products divided by reactants. Write the KC expression for this. I'll do it with you in a minute. All right, so here we go. So we've got Kc is equal to products on top, which is H3O and OH. And then on the bottom, can we just do this? We've got two waters, so call it water squared. So we've got H2O, and we can just square that because there's two of them, and that would be the Kc expression for this. Yes? No. That is not the KC expression for this, guys. Why not? Well, the reason is more clear if we put subscripts on these. Water's a liquid. Water's a liquid. This is an ion dissolved in water, and this is an ion dissolved in water. This is a heterogeneous equilibria. What things never show up in heterogeneous equilibrias? Liquids and solids because they don't have molarities and they don't have pressures. If it's a pressure equilibria, liquids and pure liquids and pure solids don't show up. So what that means is this entire denominator goes away. You should do that too if you made the same mistake I did. So guys, now what we have is we have the Kc expression for water ionizing itself. So instead of calling this Kc, we call this Kw because it's for water. Find it on your AP equation sheet. Ooh, I'm almost out of these. Who needs one? You guys all have them? Oh, you guys. Did you find it there? You guys all got KW, right? So guys, now that we've got this equation, KW, that's... Uh, okay, so it's not hearing this click. Huh. All right, so this is going to freak out my board, but I don't know how else to do this. Okay, so now let's see if I can click. Hey, there we go. So guys, now that we have this equation, 
we've got to understand where this happens. So guys, you under, actually, well, okay, we'll leave it here. So guys, you understand this is happening in a bucket of water, right? It could be this, I mean, literally, water. When water's, when, we, when you have, it's doing this. And I can't really do it because I can't pick these apart. But you can, pi- oh, maybe I can. You can picture one of these, oh, shoot, hydrogen's coming off and it sticks onto here. And then we've got an OH and we've got H3Os, right? Guys, the, the, the important question is this. In a bucket of water, how extensive is this reaction? We understand that, it, that, it's, that it's an equilibrium process, right? From the previous equation, we know that it's an equilibrium process. But guys, how much of this is taking place? And guys, we actually know the answer. We've taken water, pure water, at room temperature, and we've actually figured out how much water is being converted into hydronium and into hydroxide. But guys, there's an important point here we need to understand before we get in. Oh, shoot. I didn't need that bracket. Guys, there's an important idea that we need to understand before we get into this. So guys, we've got the concentration of hydronium and we've got the concentration of hydroxide. Without lending a number to this, conceptually, what will those concentrations be compared to each other? Why the same? Explain to the person next to you why they're the same. So guys, let's talk about it together. Why are they the same? The reason that they're the same is because of where they come from. A water reacts with the water. And every time that happens, we get one of these and one of these. They are perfectly the same because every time you form one, you form the other. Get the idea? Okay, now let's get into some numbers. Guys, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have actually studied this reaction and we have calculated, we have measured the value for KW. The value for KW, I'm seriously back to this again. All right, guys, there's nothing I can do. I can adjust, but it just means this is going to happen a lot. Guys, the value for KW, which you want to write down, is this. KW's value is 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. It is very small. But guys, have any of you had the aha moment? And by the way, this is on the AP equation sheet, not a number you need to memorize, right? Find it to make sure you see it. See KW there? It's on the... Okay, but guys, do this. If this is 1 times 10 to the negative 14th, assuming that your algebra skills will get you there, what do the values for the molarities of H3O and OH have to be? 1 times 10 to the negative 7th and 1 times 10 to the negative 7th? Do you get it? What's the connection, Maddie? The pH of water is 7. This is why. Guys, let that soak in. No pun intended. Guys, why is the pH of water 7? And the reason is because in a bucket of pure water, as water is protonating itself, we end up with a molarity of both ions of 1 times 10 to the negative 7th. Some of you are drawing on what you remember last year, and pH is the negative log of hydronium ion concentration, and the negative log of 1 times 10 to the negative 7th is 7. That's why the pH of pure water is 7. It's because water is protonating itself and it does it to the point where the molarities are 1 times 10 to the negative 7th and that makes a pH of 7. Do you see that connection? Okay. 
Guys, this though is when things get interesting because remember what we've said. What do we know about the hydronium ion? What do we know about the hydronium and hydroxide concentrations in water? They're one times 10 to the negative seventh, but importantly, they're the same. But they don't have to be the same. Guys, check this out. We need a beaker. And if we have a beaker of water, we got a lot of water, right? But we've also got some hydronium ion, and we've also got some hydroxide ion. And what do we know about those molarities? They're the same. But guys, watch. This is critical to you. They are only the same if this is pure water. So what happens if we dump some HCl into this? Guys, what does the HCl do to water? What does that chemistry look like? What are our products? Hydronium ion and chloride. Chloride's a spectator. We don't need to talk about that. But guys, this is the critical bit. When you dump HCl into this bucket of water, we're making a bunch more hydronium ion. So now the hydronium ion concentration is not the same as the hydroxide ion concentration. Get it? But guys, guess what doesn't change? This. The KW for water does not change. So as this number goes up, as we add acid, and as hydronium ion goes up, what has to happen to the hydroxide ion concentration for that number to not change? It's got to go down. So guys, this equation, I have no idea. Just bear with me. i got to clean this up. So guys, this this equation, do I dare do this? I wonder, okay, I'm going to try this. This could go bad, but I'm going to try it. I think if I just unplug this mouse, that may fix it, because I think this mouse is confusing my computer. All right, so guys, the idea then becomes this. Imagine that this equation is a seesaw, and this number doesn't change. Because that number doesn't change, as this goes up, what has to happen to hydroxide ion concentration? It goes down. And so literally these teeter-totter on that fulcrum. And so as this goes up, this has to go down proportionally because this doesn't change. And as this goes up, this goes down proportionally, again, because KW doesn't change. Remember, that's just an equilibrium constant, and they are constants. Just like our 70-30, or whatever it was, is a constant. Guys, those KWs don't change. And as a result, as one goes up, the other's got to go down because KW doesn't change. So what's the value of that? And guys, Guess not. I don't know what to do. Um, guys, the value, oh, now I can't do that. <laughs> I just made things worse. And that's worse. And this might be better. OK, so guys, the value of that is this. This relationship for pure water not only holds for pure water, it holds for all aqueous acid-base relationships. And again, as I said, it creates this seesaw situation, whereas one goes up, the other goes down, and vice versa. So guys, this then creates a question. How do we figure out these hydronium ion concentrations in the first place? I'm going to just plug this back in because that didn't buy me anything. Yeah? It is. No, yeah, absolutely it's Le Chatelier's principle because if, I don't even know if I can write on my board anymore, but that's exa oh, I, it worked. So H and water and equilibrium and hydronium ion and hydroxide ion. That's exactly what's going on. So if we dump an acid into water, it makes this go up, so this goes down, right? Same side does the opposite. That's exact, this is Le Chatelier's principle in equation form. Yeah, that's a great observation. Yeah? So 
Either one. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, so let's. So, we know that we can change the pH by adding acid, right? But we can also change the pH by adding base. And so, if we if we have a bucket of water, and in there we've got some hydronium and we've got some hydroxide, and then imagine that we add a strong base to that, like sodium hydroxide. If we dump sodium hydroxide into this, then the OH is going to go up. And as the OH goes up, the hydronium will go down so that KW doesn't change. Is that okay? So what you're going to find in a minute is that we can actually do this mathematically. So if we know the concentration of one of these, we can figure out the concentration of the other because it will always multiply together to give us 10 to the negative 14th. Is that okay? We good to go? So guys, this last question. We now know that we can measure this value of 10 to the negative 14th, but how did they actually measure it? And the answer is they didn't. They calculated it. But in order to calculate it, what we need to know is we need to know these values, right? And so how do we measure the concentration of hydronium ion? With the pH meter. So guys, it sounds like some of you remember this, some of you don't. Can we have a group hug? I think I need one. Of course, I'd go to jail, and that would be bad. But it might be better than having to deal with this. All right, so so guys, the idea then becomes this. If you don't remember these equations, they're worth writing down. So pH is the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. Or importantly, pH is also the negative log of hydronium ion concentration. Now, guys, are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with the idea that these equations are the same? Because acids give away hydrogen ion. Where do they do that? In water. Where do the hydrogen ion go? To the water to form hydronium. So we can talk about the water or not. But in either case, this concentration and that concentration are the same because when acids release hydrogen ions, they go to water to form hydronium. Is that okay? I'm just, this is review, but just making sure. So are you okay with these ideas? The pH is a mathematical expression of hydrogen ion or of strength of acid or base. It's really a measure of hydronium or hyd hydrogen ion concentration. Low pHs are acidic, high pHs are basic, and it allows us to figure out concentrations in water. Is that okay? Okay. So guys, this then is where we need to bring these ideas together. Let this soak in for a second. Do not think that this is an acid conjugate relationship. This is a hydrogen ion, hydronium ion relationship chart. I'm just, this is going to freak out again. I'd like to point out that I haven't cussed yet, right? That's pretty good. So proud of, oh wait, we need that at the top. Wait, oh shoot, never mind, hold on, this is gonna freak out again. Oh, it didn't, there it is. Now let's move this over. So guys, contained in this chart is not only what we learned last year about things that are acidic and things that are basic, but now it brings together this interesting idea of these relationships between hydrogen and hydroxide. So I just, want, I, I just want to let you sit with this for a minute. And then I want to talk about these interesting relationships. So guys, what do you find interesting? There's no right answer, right? But what caught your eye? Yeah. Absolutely. So these are all multiply, multipliers. They all multiply together to come up with 10 to the negative 14th, right? So if we have 
a, a base that has like 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. That's a base. If we have a base that has a hydroxide ion concentration of 10 to the negative first, the hydronium ion concentration will be 10 to the negative 13th. Multiplying those together then gives us 10 to the negative 14th. Similarly down here, if we have stomach acid, which is very acidic, 1 times 10 to the negative first as its concentration of, of hydronium ion, hydrogen ion, then the hydroxide ion concentration will be proportionally low. And again, they multiply together to give us this. So these relationships are represented in that equation. Go ahead. That's also an interesting thought. Um, guys, check this out. We, we understand this. We understand that pH is the, negative, is the negative log of hydrogen ion. So for example, if we have a hydrogen ion concentration of 1 times 10 to the negative first, that would be a pH of 1. If we have a hydrogen ion concentration, like in water, of 10 to the negative seventh, that would be a pH of 7. If we have a hydrogen ion concentration of 1 times 10 to the negative thirteenth, that's 13. But guys, we can do the same thing with hydroxide ion concentrations. They're called pOH. So pOH is the negative log of hydroxide ion concentration. So if the hydroxide ion concentration is 10 to the negative first, that would be a pOH of 1. If the hydroxide ion concentration is 10 to the negative 7, that'd be 7. If the hydroxide ion concentration is 10 to the negative 13th, that would be 13. So guys, we can also have pOH. But now pull the two together. So guys, Josh made this observation. He said these always multiply together to be 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. But guys, what about these and these? What's their mathematical relationship? They always add together to be... 14. Find that in your AP equation sheet. It's still there, right? It's under equilibrium. Hey, there it is. Do you see it? It's third from the bottom. 14 is equal to pH plus pOH. So guys, whether, whether your algebraic skills allow this or not, the equation that says Kw, 10 to the negative 14th, is equal to hydrogen times hydroxide, and the equation that says 14 is equal to pH plus pOH, those are functionally the same. So this equation, and let's make Kw 1 times 10 to the negative 14th, that equation and this equation are saying the same thing. If you take the negative log of this, you get 14. If you take the log of this, you get pH. If you take the negative log of this, you get pOH. So guys, those two equations are functionally the same. So why do we care? And the answer is because the AP authors are evil. What they'll do to you is this. They're going to give you a question on the test where in order to solve it, you're going to need this. Guys, can you imagine this? You need to know the hydroxide ion concentration. But what they're going to give you is pOH. And you've got to figure out how to convert that into hydronium ion concentration. So maybe what you do is this. You plug in the pOH for this, and then that allows you to get pH. And then once you know the pH, you can plug that into pH is equal to the negative log of hydronium ion concentration, and that'll allow you to come up with hydronium ion concentration. They love to play these games to check whether or not you're aware of all these interrelated relationships. So we've got two. KW is this, and pH plus pOH is 14. Yeah? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the answer is because when we talk about that fundamental, forgive the baseline, no pun, um, it's pure water. So pure water is our starting point, and then from there, you're absolutely right. We can range away from that by adding acids or bases, but our baseline is pure water. Is that okay? How you doing, y'all? We're almost done. You guys good? Okay. So guys, again, this is all super foundational stuff. Um, and you're going to have, I know sometimes at this point people are like, whoa, these are all these, these big and yet detail-oriented ideas, and am I okay? Because trust the homework. That's why this homework, you've already seen it, that's why this homework assignment is so big. Um, it's simply because we need, we need to practice all these little things to make sure we're, we're, we're aware enough to solve problems with this. So I don't know what this is going to do. Yep, drawing dots again. You know what I need? A scapegoat. Who can I blame this on? What about my TA? Not Diana. All right, not Diana. Preston? <laughs> Spencer just threw you under the bus. All right. Okay, so... Guys, are we okay with these ideas? Are we... Hang on. Are we okay with the idea that there's this other logarithmic relationship that says that POH is the negative log of OH? Are we okay with the idea that pH plus pOH is 10 to the 14th? Both ideas that we lifted off that previous table. Are we good? Okay. Guys, I know there's a question here to solve. Um, we sort of alluded to it a minute ago. We're not going to. Is it met well? I'll leave it and deal with it later. So guys, we've got one more thing to talk about and we're done for the day and then I'm going to strongly encourage you to work on homework. Um, but guys, this is, this is review. This is not new. But we do need to talk about it to make sure we're clear. You guys ready to move on? One last idea? Okay. <laughs> Look at me thinking that's going to do it. Well, not always, because this hasn't, but, but, well, but actually all the worse on a, on a Mac because of the way Macs capture the screen. Um, okay, so guys, do this with me. Draw, your, draw yourself a beaker. Come back to our roots. And guys, in that beaker, make it a beaker of water. And then guys, draw in the species that exist in a beaker of water. Distilled water at room temperature. By the way, we should say that. You know how we said KW 10 to the negative 14th doesn't change? It does if we change the temperature. Right? Because that's one of the things that changes KW. KC. But guys, you ready? What is in a beaker of water? Water. Yeah, it's true. There's water in a beaker of water. There's a lot of water in a beaker of water. But guys, what else is in a beaker of water? Hydronium ion. A little bit. 10 to the negative 7th molar at room temperature, and there's a little bit of hydroxide. So guys, off to the right here, let's write down the molarities. Let's do this. Let's just write down the molarity of the hydronium ion. But just for fun, no, it's not that fun. Point, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, one. You can if you want, but we're going to write down the molarity as a decimal. Did we do that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Now, guys, here's what we're going to do. Let's make this a one liter vessel. Well, sorry. Let's make it a liter of water. And then let's dump in one mole of HCl molecules. By the way, guys, we should talk about this. I don't think we've said this yet. So this is HCl, not in water. Do you guys know? What does HCl look like before you put it in water and turn it into an acid? Do any of you know? It's actually a gas. Guys, all of the strong acids are actually gases before they go into solution. Kind of interesting. So really what we would do to do this is we would take a tank of HCl gas and we would bubble it through the water until we've put 36.7 grams of HCl, a mole, into the water. So, but in, in any case, we dump a mole of acid into the water. What is now the molarity of hydronium ion in the beaker? <laughs> right. So, guys, putting a mole in a liter, this makes it one molar, yes? So we just created a one molar solution of HCl. But I love what Chase did, because he's like, it's one molar point zero 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 one. Guys, that's functionally the point. The hydronium ion that's there as a result of the autoionization of water is so ridiculously small that it's a rounding error and we don't worry about it. Does that make sense? The question becomes, so what? And the answer is this. Don't write this one down. But guys, now imagine that this is a one molar solution of HCl. If this is a one molar solution of HCl, what is the molarity of hydronium ion? That you should know the answer to. When we, and we're going to do this in just a minute. Guys, you're going to go into lab. We're going to titrate today. And you're going to go into lab and you're going to grab a bottle of one molar HCl. Guys, we should make sure we're clear on this. Guys, you're going to go into lab today and you're going to grab a bottle of one molar. It's going to say on it, one molar HCl. Guys, how much HCl is in that bottle? None. Yes? There is no HCl in that bottle because when we put HCl in water, what does it do? It forms hydronium ion and it forms chloride ion. How much of this doesn't do that? None. It's a strong acid. So guys, when you pick up a bottle of HCl, you ain't got no HCl. You've got hydronium ion and you've got chloride ion. So now coming back to the question, how much? So if you've got a bottle of one molar HCl, what's the molarity of the hydronium ion? Guys, all, oh, sorry, wrong way. What happened to all the HCl? It turned into hydronium ion. So guys, if it's one molar HCl, it's actually one molar hydronium ion. So guys, if you've got one molar HCl, you've actually got one molar hydronium ion. Yes? So then guys, from there we can play this game. What's the pH? Well, pH is the negative log of H3O plus is the negative log of one. And guys, what is the log of one? Zero. This has a pH of zero. You're like, wait, I thought the pH scale goes one through 14. 
In nature, it does. In chemistry, we can even generate negative pHs. So guys, the pH of one molar HCl is zero. But the big idea is this. If you know the molarity of a strong acid, what you actually know is the molarity of hydronium ion in that solution, because all of the strong acid turned into hydronium. That's what makes it a strong acid. You guys good on that idea? Does that sit okay? Can I tell you what's coming on Tuesday? Little foreshadowing. Ready? Same beaker, only now we've got one molar. Now we've got one molar acetic acid. What is the molarity of hydronium ion in a one molar acetic acid solution? Is it one molar? Why not? It's not strong. So guys, how are we going to figure out the molarity of a one molar acetic acid solution? Ice box. Hmm? And that's where we're headed next. So guys, for now, you just need to know this, that the molarity of a strong acid is actually the molarity of the hydronium ion in solution. They're the same because it's strong. Good? Okay. So guys, I give up on clicking. I'm just going to mosey over here. Um, did you see me mosey? I just moseyed. I don't, oh, okay, now I'm going to cuss. Hey, that actually worked. <laughs> oh, shoot, it broke it. <laughs> Guys, here, uh, here's your homework. I got to stop recording before I actually do cuss. So that's done.